So everything I'm going to say is relevant to fly fishing from a boat in Grafham. Uh, that's where we do most of our Xander fly fishing. So first off, what rod would you need? Well, we've ended up using primarily 10 weight predator rods. This is a Vision Big Daddy rod. It's a 10 weight rod, it's nine foot long. This is really a big pike fly rod. And I've also got a 10 weight Vision uh, GT4 SW. It's a saltwater GT rod that's 10 weight, again, nine foot long. And they're very similar blanks. This is a little bit soft, a bit more mid flex than the uh, Vision Big Daddy, which has sort of a, difficult to say, but it gets stronger the, long, the harder you load it with bigger flies. It really is a big fly rod, no doubt about it. Uh, both of these rods I got second hand on eBay. I think I paid about 150 quid for the Big Daddy and I paid about 100 pounds for the GT4. And that GT, GT4 rod is a bargain. It's a cracking rod. It's one of my favorite rods. I'm a big fan of Vision rods. Uh, they just, I've never been disappointed by one yet. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of other manufacturers that make good 10 weights, but the thing about Vision is they do and have made saltwater rods for quite some time, so you can pick them up secondhand. Uh, what's next? So the reels, obviously you have a 10 weight reel, large arbor, which just basically means it's got a large capacity. Uh, this is a Pike Trek reel. Now the rod I had before I got these ones was I had a Pike Trek rod, which I sold to Kevin, um, and he's used it. Uh, so we've both owned it and it's still going strong. So it's a, they're not a bad rod. If you can get one, I wouldn't pay more than a hundred quid for one. Um, they weren't that expensive when they were new, if I remember rightly, but um, they're perfectly serviceable. If you're on a budget, they might be one to look out for. Uh, Real wise, these Pike Trek reels are pretty good actually. I, I've always rather liked the design of them. Um, they're not very heavy, they come with interchangeable spools. And yeah, I've got no reason to want to upgrade this at all. It works fine. And um, it's been dropped in the water a few times, it's been covered in rubbish. It's survived very rainy, cold days. It's always been okay. Um, so that's good. I'm also, I'm a big fan of Sierra reels. I've got a bit of a thing for Sierras and Vision. Some of the Vision reels are really nice. Uh, not all of them though. Some of the cheaper M ones are a bit, mm, they're okay. I'm not sure they're that competitive. So I'm not selling Vision stuff really. Um, this reel is a Witchwood, uh, what's it called? True Fly SLA large arbor reel and it is large i mean if you compare it to the pike trek it's maybe a bit more like a salmon reel. <laughs> she looks really big there it's not quite as big as in comparison it's not so huge and it's not to be honest it doesn't it's very lightweight for the size of it it actually feels lighter than the than the pike trek um this was about oh, 50 quid on ebay in a nice case with three cassette spools. Honestly, if, you, if this, this is year one and you want the cheapest one, this has proved to be perfectly fine. Um, it's, it's slightly under-engineered, but it's not badly designed for it. It just is quite a simple reel and the cassette system works very, very well. It's surprising how well this thing has been designed it's not made very expensively but the um the drag works fine on it not had any problems it's not an amazing drag to be honest but um what i would say is that using the drag uh which you do some of the time particularly if you hook a big pike or maybe even a large bream um it is useful however we're talking quite big fish here so the subtleties of a really nice drag that you might enjoy with a trout uh, reel don't really come into play it's either pulling the reel off you know it's either pulling off the line way too fast and you crank the brakes on and 
you know, or it's it it's fun. You get the whole kind of the reels running and clicking drag moment, uh, but it's not really. What I'm trying to say is the finesse doesn't matter too much. Um, so a reel like this, uh, I think it represents really good value. And it, you know, it just hasn't broken. It's been dropped, thrown all, all over the boat. Um, spools are good. They're nice, actually. They fit in really quite nicely. They've got a little ridge in, and it, they just once you get used to where that lines up, it's really quite quick to change the um, spool over. Let's turn that out of there. If you haven't got the thing all caught around. Um, He's going to demonstrate it now. There's a red dot somewhere. There we go. Where is that? All the way around. See, they're foolproof. <laughs> there we go. Locked. Stick that back on again. Screw that up. And you're done. So, on to the lines. Well, the line is really the biggest, if you like, expense and uh, makes the biggest difference. You can use cheap lines. Kevin and I uh, fished the first couple of seasons with a couple of lines that probably cost us, I think, about £12 a line. Uh, they were DI7 lines from Pike Trek, and they were okay. They weren't brilliant to cast, and they only lasted a couple of years in reality, but uh, we fished with them, and they worked. Um, if you've got a budget for a line and you want to give yourself the best chance with casting distances and the best overall line, I would say probably this uh, this line, which is on this spool. Let's see if I can show you that. Uh, it's this line, which is Airflow 40 plus Sniper. It's 10 weight, obviously. Weight forward 10, sink rate seven. This line has been has proved really good for us. This is um, depth finder, 30 foot head. It's a 400 grain weighted line, basically. It's not lead core. It's just got a 30 foot, very fast sink front end on it. It's probably, a, well, it might be something like a DI 10. And then the rest of the line is sort of an intermediate. So what it does is it drops a big, long, flat line down in the water, horizontal with the bottom, and then you've got an intermediate line coming up. So you don't get that belly effect happening. Uh, it's very good, especially if it's a windy day. Okay, line connections. So on your spool, I, I just use this standard 20 pound backing line on the spool, which goes on first. You can see that's, that's it there in yellow. Um, that spools through. I usually do a loop to loop connection on a little section, and then you see that's actually nail knotted onto the actual fly line on that one. The reason you do that is it will run through the rings smoothly. So if you do end up on the backing, you're not going to get stopped or lose the connection. Uh, there's loads of videos about how to do that on YouTube, have a good look around for nail knot or fly line backing to fly line connections. So at the other end of the fly line, you might add a loop connection like that. They look like these. Um, now we started out using these, you, you squeeze it onto the line and you push this down and then as it pulls, it tightens on the line, a bit of super glue on there as well. And it, you know, they're very robust. I've stopped using these completely now. And two reasons. One is the new fly lines, as I said, are very uh, low in, dynamit in diameter. So you want a big loop because you're using big flies and big fish, but the diameter isn't right. And uh, it's quite troublesome. And you end up with this long bit of quite sort of annoying material on the end of your fly line and then you fluorocarbon runs off that and you don't need to do it I've discovered a knot on YouTube in a video which I'll find and put the link below so do have a look um, and I've started using this for linking all of my uh, leader material if you like to my fly lines 
and the knock looks like if I can show you that there we go like that now what I've got is there's obviously it's joining the fluoro which is in a loop and then it goes through this notch. I'll put a link how to tie these. Um, it works a treat. I've used it on all diameter fly lines, uh, on the five weight and three weight lines that I use. Uh, I've even sort of put epoxy over it and smoothed it so it's just a little, little tiny bump. But um, yeah, that's been tied, I think two seasons now. <laughs> About time I put some new fluorocarbon into it. Uh, but managing to tie those in the boat a lot easier than trying to re-glue a blooming loop or mess about with it. So that's my recommendation. That knot will do the job. Happy days. No need for a loop unless you've already got one. Next to that bit, obviously we've got fluorocarbon. Okay. All the way down. Now, how much fluorocarbon? Well, still experimenting. Um, you don't really need very much when predators are fishing because you're fishing a big fly, so maybe an arm's length. But obviously being fluoro, it sinks, and also you want as much movement in the fly as you can have, but you also want the consistency and depth. And so if you think that the main fly line has the biggest effect underwater on the... Uh, let's see if I can show you this. On the fly. So if the fly is just off the line by a few inches and this moves up and down, then it's going to make a lot of movement, right? But if it's the fly's further out and this moves up and down, uh, let's see if I can make that, and this moves up and down like so, then this has got to move a long way before the fly is moved out of range. So the thing to think about is are the fish after a very active fly? Or are they after something that's kind of just flipping along in a straight line? That's my thought on these things. And I welcome everybody else's opinion. Um, sometimes just having a different length leader seems to make a difference between myself and Kevin. I'd also say Kevin's using 30 pound fluoro. I generally lose 20. But all up, I think probably 30 is a good bet. And... There's a few reasons for that. One is it's slightly thicker to tie onto the um, wire leader, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the other reason is that it'll potentially sink a bit, a bit quicker. Um, so 20 pound or 30 pound, uh, I think now if I thought about it, I think I'll shift the 30 pound. Uh, I really think it, it has that, that effect of balancing with the fly. And then the length, well, yeah, going to experiment with that if we ever get out in the boat again. Because um, I think there's a bit to, bit to know about that. I've got a funny feeling a short leader will be good for perch and a long leader will be good for sander. And maybe somewhere in between will be good for pike. Um, so at the other end of your fluoro, 20 or 30 pound, is... Um, a wire leader. Oh, I'll just say something about these as well. So I've tried these. These are Rio Pike Musky Leaders. Now, they're not bad. They're not cheap. Uh, they're not too bad, actually. Um, what was good about them? Well, they are a tapered leader, so they cast quite nicely. Um, and they've got basically like a Surflon micro wire on, you know, um, quality wire on the on the end uh, to a pretty sure it's a loop connection actually um, and they work pretty well they've got an all bright knot between the nylon and the wire and that's pretty good they and they did hold up quite well I would say don't bother for Xander fishing um, they, these are really nice for surface fishing for pike which is what it says on the packet being uh being nylon they don't sink as well as fluoro um and also it's just quite an expensive weight i mean you can have a whole spool of nylon for that 
Uh, and you, you don't need that kind of perfect turnover of the fly when you're fishing 20 foot down. You just don't, it's not going to make any difference. So I would say 20 pound. Yeah, okay, if you're pike fly fishing, good for that. So going back to my rig, so we come down, our leader's 20, 30 pound fluoro. That's just a perfection loop to where it would have attached. This is one I've made up ready as a backup. And then here I've got a not very great looking Albright knot onto um, AFW Surflon. I forgot. Surflon Micro Ultra. Uh, that's 11 pounds, but um, that's the stuff I use. But there are other knottable wires. Kevin's using a different one. He's tried crimping traces up uh, a few other things. He quite often just has a perfection loop to a loop connection on his fluoro. I prefer that all bright. It's more direct. I think you get a better, uh, better indication of a bite. And then at this end, I've got a fast stitch clip. Not as easy to see that really. Uh, with just connected with a little perfection loop and you can tie you can tie that on with a perfection loop what you do is you make the loop first the first bit of the perfection loop right and then you would put your fast hatch clip on that that end and then wrap round make the perfection loop and then tuck the the uh, fast hatch through that hole taking that line through and then you put it tight and then you end up with your perfection loop with a fast hatch clip on it. It's pretty good. If someone wants me to, desperately wants me to demo that, I will. Like most forms of fishing, uh, you end up with way too many flies. So I'm not gonna go through all of them. I've got all sorts of homemade monstrosities. Like this and I made these that didn't do anything. Um, <laughs> you want to see some of my fly disasters? <laughs> Here's a fly disaster. This, this this one's called the I'm horribly crippled. Please kill me now, fly. And um, this one's the spit. This I called it the um, what did I call this? The total wreck roach or something. <laughs> but that caught a twelve. That caught a ten pound. <laughs> Um, right, proper flies, proper flies made by proper fly making people. Uh, these flies are the best we've found and uh, they're made by a guy called Cato who's a member of the Lure Angling Society but I think you might be able to find him online somewhere. I don't have a link, he doesn't have a shop, you just got to get in touch with him. But he says, a guy called Cato, member of the Lure Angling Society, um, lovely guy, makes fantastic flies and um, this is the pattern that we have had most success with. It's kind of a slightly yellowy pattern with a bit of darkness in it. There's one with a red um, in it. Those two, have, that, that kind of pattern's done better than most other things, but everything on its day. Um, I, I'm quite experimental and a bit more creative. And Kevin so I will make all sorts of horrible <laughs> mistakes and then try and fish them. Here's another one. <laughs> Look at the state of that. This actually did catch as well. Can you believe it? Um, so there you go. No accounting for taste. Um, I quite like sparklies at certain times of the year. There's a sparkle clouser I've made. This thing's got quite crazily heady, heavy bead heads um, so it really just works the bottom, but yeah, that's caught. Um, what else? I'm almost embarrassed to show you some of these really. Um, I, d I have made a lot of clouds of flies and they have caught, um, but I've even caught on these kind of, it's kind of pike bunny thing, it's a zonka type thing on a sinking line in shallow water at very slow speed so this is sort of floating 
and going along the bottom like that. Uh, red and white was a good colour for that. So this, the, believe it or not, this is the first fly, or the what's remains of it, I ever caught a zander on. It's a clouser from uh, Sportfish, and there was a bit more to it when it when I was fishing it before. It's got a bit chewed and it's had to be trimmed. Uh, but these clousers do work quite well, and you can see why. I mean, they really do kind of give a little bait fish pattern, and they're quite mobile and they sink well. So clousers are always worth a go. Right, I think that's about it. Um, what have we done? Rods, onto the reel, onto the line, the bit, the trace, fast hatch clips. I use a couple of different sizes of fast hatch clips, the sort of medium size. Really the size you use is dependent on the size of the, you know, the hook that you, you've got to put the thing through. Right, okay. Well, there we go. I think that's it. Feel free to ask any questions. Hopefully Grafham will open in April and then that means we will be able to get out in May to start some fishing again. Last year was a bit bitty because we got shut down in the middle of the season and then the lure fishing season started and then it stopped and we didn't get anywhere. It was probably our worst season ever at Grafham um, in terms of the lure fishing. But then it's been very, there's very little fishing being done over the last year there so who knows what awaits us in the spring. We'll look forward to it. Um, right, that's all for now. I'll make a film anytime I get a chance. See you all soon. Cheers.